channel. Now I just want to take the time to say thank you and sorry. Thank you to all of the guys who have subscribed to the channel. I'm now at 345 subscribers, which in the YouTube world might not be big, but to me that's absolutely crazy. And the fact that a lot of those people have taken the time out of their day to just even send me a message as a kind of a pat on the back and say, hey, good luck with the conversion, or to show me pictures of their conversion, it's absolutely crazy. There's so many people out there, it's really true what they say. Land Rover guys are nice guys. Sorry to the guys who have waited so long for this video. I know there's plenty of you out there who are looking to do this conversion themselves and are not too sure about a few things, so I've been trying to get the time to get this video out to you as quick as possible. Now the good news is I have got the Land Rover to a point where it's running and drivable. Not complete, just drivable. So in this video, I'm going to be fabricating an engine stand. If you remember from the last video, I swore that I would never drag an M57 through my house again. I had to fabricate an engine stand which would allow me to easily bring it from my workshop back through the house to the front of the house where I'm going to be doing the engine swap and also allow me to start the engine and test it while it's in the stand to make sure I have no issues. So that being said guys, let's get straight into the video, I hope you enjoy. So now that the main part of the engine hoist, engine stand. So now that the main part of the engine transporter is made, I'm going to just stick it on underneath, see how it looks and then I have to fabricate some mounts. But you'll get a rough idea of what it's going to look like. So from the engine mounts here, I'm going to make some tubes. I can drop this down a little bit lower, and then I'm going to make some tubes to extend up to mount on either side. So you can see how the engine mount is going to work from here. Get the engine mount with the stud in it. It's just going to slide into the BMW mount, a washer, and an M10 nut. Lovely. What I can do from there then is get some short tubes, weld it down to this one. I don't think I'll need to brace it because it's pretty much directly above here. So it's not going to be an issue. So these steel mounts will be fine for now. Uh, obviously when we get into the Land Rover, we're going to want to mount some, some more flexible mounts than that. Land Rovers are shaky enough without that kind of madness. Yeah, so not bad at that, not bad. I'll just take a little bit more off this side and that's it. Right, I think we let the engine down a little bit. It just touches that. Center the frame up and get a tack oil on that as well. So I'm just going to loosen off that nut now. I'm happy with that where it is. I'm just going to loosen it off in case there's a bit of movement in it when I'm trying to position the mount for the other side. I don't want to break those tacks. Go, oh, mount number two. Way out of alignment. All I'm doing now is just trying to align this thing, get it centered up, and get a tack weld on that new mount. And as you can see, it's very difficult to do with one man. So now that the front mounts are pretty much done, i got to position it to get the rear mounts as well. Now I know the engine has to come up a lot on the back, which is going to throw these out, which is why I didn't weld them up as they were, you know, I know it has to come up this way, so I've just tack welded them for now. I'm expecting them to twist a little bit, and I don't want to go too much, I only want to go a few mil up, and uh, then we can support the back somehow. So I have to cut that little tack weld there and move this tube back a little bit because when I lifted it up, it's gonna want it's bringing this tube back. So it moved it about 10 mil over, which is fine. So it's back in its correct position now. Engine is centered this way. It's at the right level, at the right height. It's level this way and that way, and uh, 
I think we're ready to just put in this little brace here. So I'm going to notch a little tube to go from here to there, just to fill in that little gap, make it a good bit stronger. And once that's in, that will be bulletproof. So guys, if you enjoy fabrication like this, stay tuned. Because I've got a lot more projects coming up in the future that I want to feature on the channel also. Now, uh, for example, I'm making a NAS rear step, which I've already sat on, so I'll try and get a video out on that soon. Now, I'm looking at purchasing a few new tools, like a milling machine, which I've always wanted since I was a kid. I've always wanted a lathe, and I got one over a year ago now. Uh, my next big purchase is going to be a, a, a compact milling machine that I can fit into my already tiny workshop. So stay tuned if you like metal fabrication, as well as Land Rovers, motorbikes, dirt bikes, etc. Okay, so we got the two engine mounts. I took the time to make them a little bit nicer than the rest of them, just because they're going to be on full display out here. Uh, but I don't want to get too carried away, because it's not a show pony, and I've already made the world's most complicated kids trailer. So, we'll get two tubes onto this, just like so. We'll get them notched, welded in, and that should be our engine mounted. So, we've cut the two tubes, notched them, they fit in nicely. I think we'll uh, get some tack welds on them. Once they're tacked in place, this engine will finally be mounted in this stand. Looks cool, doesn't it? So there we go. Stand is off the engine, back in the welding table to just finish up the last few welds. That uh, looks pretty cool, I think. <laughs> I'm quite happy with it. Looks very kind of over the top. <laughs> the most over the top little trailer I've ever seen. But hey, it looks good, I'm happy with it. It could be used many times over. Oh man. So we're ready to start putting this uh, whole clutch assembly and flywheel and uh, bell housing back together permanently now. So I've just talked the, I've just put a bit of thread lock on the flywheel bolts and talked them down. I'm just dropping in clutch fix clutch for this. Now this clutch is specifically made for, let's say the P38. I think it's more intended for P38, you know, conversions using the P38 bell housing and flywheel. But uh, it is a P38 clutch, only this thing is heavy duty. I think off the top of my head it hold, it's good for about 650 newton meters which is way above what this engine is going to be capable of putting out maybe you could get that kind of you know you maybe you could get those kind of numbers out with the newer M57s but I don't think this one I think I'm expecting it around again off the top of my head in around 500 newton meters with this but um should be well able for it put it this way this will hold a lot more power than the R380 transmission will this thing will allow you to rip the R380 to pieces in theory. So we'll see how much how well it holds up. The R380 I think is supposed to be rated to 380 newton meters. But uh, with these things you never know. Like, I mean you could you could possibly break that at 300 newton meters or it could withstand 500 newton meters without an issue if you drove it sensibly. So we'll find out soon won't we. I'm not too worried. If something goes wrong with the R380 transmission, if it does shear some gears or break a shaft or whatever I'll start looking. It, I will start looking for a BMW six-speed box, which would be uh, a good match for this engine. But until then, we'll run with the R380 and see how it stands up because I'm kind of curious myself. And plus, I could not find a six-speed BMW anywhere, so I was kind of forced to go down this route. Anyway, it's not as if I had a say in the matter. awkward to get out was the longest piece of aluminium I had <laughs> 
So, next step I think is to install these uh, hardened fork pins, the clutch fix supply. It's in this little packet with the uh, spline grease. So you see these two little split pins here? They recommend to remove these because they think this clutch is going to be so heavy afterwards that you just shear those pins. So they've given us, they are hollow pins called split pins. These are solid hardened steel pins. Idea is just to knock them out, knock in the new steel ones. For some reason I cannot find my hammer, my steel hammer. I've got plenty of dead blow hammers and rubber mallets, but I just, I don't know where my steel hammer's gone, so some viewers may find this disturbing. Yeah, that's a bit looser than I was expecting. I mean, the old one came out in three pieces, so I guess I see what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not meant to do that. You know, that is very loose. Okay, I guess we'll have to just uh, come back to that because I'm not sure why they're not a tight fit in there. And if somebody drilled it out, you know, because you see the original pins that were in there. There's two pins inside it. I'm not sure if they're meant to be two pins like that. Or did somebody put them in there just to try and uh, make it a bit stronger? You can see one of them was broken into three pieces. So perhaps somebody's drilled this out to try and put bigger split pins in there. I don't know. I'll give Clutch Fix a call on that later and see what he says. Till then. We'll get this bell housing back on and see if we can get this engine started. Right, we'll try this before I hook up this uh, fuel pump permanently because I'm too excited. I'm going to try this now. I can see the pressure that's going in there. Right now I have, which I'm guessing just a default, 0.99 bar. And I know I need to go up around 4 or a minimum 3.5 for this to start. So I'm just going to pump that up. Okay, what else am I missing? God, guys, can I just say, I've been messing around with this thing all day yesterday. Like, I'm really running out of time to get this in the Land Rover. I go back to work on Monday. It's now Thursday. Oh my God, it's Thursday. And I wasted all day yesterday trying to get this thing started. I just couldn't figure out what was wrong. Like, I, I could remove all of the four codes, you know, minus a few things like cruise control, data pad, all that kind of stuff that I don't need. But I wasn't getting any pressure at the fuel rail. I was checking all my connections, took off the injector hose, I'm getting fuel up there. I think it's the connection, I don't even know which one it is, but I think it might have been the connection at the regulator valve at the back of the CP1, the high pressure pump. Because I just took it off, put it back on, didn't seem to make a difference, and I took off a few other connections, put them back on, and I, you know, turned on the ignition and started it, and it fired up. Honest to God, it... <laughs> It really frightened me because I wasn't expecting it to start. I've been at this all day long, cranking this all day, and it fired up now, and I almost fell off my box. But uh, I'll fire it up for you now so you can see what I mean. 
Sounds like a bit of a pig at the moment because there's no pipe in it, but it runs. <laughs> I'm actually shaking. <laughs> So seeing as the engine is now started, we're ready to start bringing it out to put it in the Land Rover. But there's one or two things I have to sort out. If you remember earlier in the video, I have to change these pins and install the hardened steel pins supplied by Clutch Fix. Now the reason he uses these hard, hardened steel pins instead of these split pins is because he reckons these are not strong enough. And you can see from the ones I took out, he's clearly right because it was split into three different pieces. So he supplies these hardened steel pins. This is them here. And they're more, supposed to go through these holes. Now these are 5. Point, well, that's 5.3 written on it. I haven't measured it. I'm assuming it looks about 5.3 mil. And these are a little bit bigger. So like I said earlier, I'm not sure if somebody has drilled this out or not. Uh, I can't. <laughs> I tried calling earlier. It says on Google that he's open, but you know nobody's open at this time. So he might have just forgotten to uh, put it on Google. But anyways, I don't want to be hassling the man at this time of year. So I think I'm just going to put in the hardened steel pins in here myself. Now I was trying to find something I could put in here, I have these old carbide bits which are quite good, I don't want to cut them but if I had to I would. Now they're 6mm and they fit through there snugly with very little play but it needs to be tight to make sure it doesn't fall out so I'm looking for something 6.5mm and even then I think uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be very very tight in there. So I managed to find this old hole saw that I had, this old rubbish hole saw and in the centre was this drill bit which happens to be 6.5mm. And it happens to have a real long shank in it, with these grooves cut into it. So the grooves are not going to matter, I'm going to turn them to the side where there's no pressure. But this shank here is long enough for me to get two pins out of, and it's a tight fit in there. So I'm going to cut that into two, beat it in, I can't put it in by hand, I'll have to tap it in. Cut it in two, get them in there, and I think that was the last thing we had to do before we're ready to bring this out front to put it in a Land Rover. Two hardened steel pins. That's one in. And it was tight. Full disclosure guys, I am putting a little bit of epoxy on this because uh, but the way I spoke to, after speaking to Mr. Clutch Fix, he seemed pretty adamant that the standard pins in this just would not hold up and he had to use these uh, hardened steel pins. And then now that I've bought this P38 bell housing and it seems to be bigger than the pins Mr. Clutch Fix thinks should be in there, I'm thinking somebody else has drilled this out to put bigger pins in it. So I'm not sure if this is a thing with P38s but these uh, pins should definitely be strong enough anyways, but I just want to make sure that they don't fall out, you know. So I'm putting a little bit of epoxy on these. They're already a tight fit, but the epoxy is just going to help that little bit as well to make sure they don't come out. Oh guys, there's the two pins in. Let's just say a quick prayer now that we never have to take them out again because uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to cut that shaft if I want them out. <laughs> Best thing ever made for a lot of over you know. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. So in the next video again, I'm going to be showing a few things like the wiring harness, which a few of you guys have messaged me about. Um, you know, a few guys have asked me for wiring diagrams, but really I will go through this a bit more in detail in the next one. But just to give you a heads up, it's really not worth your while trying to figure out the wiring and, you know, make up your own harness when you can buy the harness from the likes of MW Machines or Wiseman Engineering it really is worth the investment to just buy this harness plug it in and save some of the wiring from your donor car and keep things simple and just fast and clean and tidy so in the next video guys I will go through a few more things like engine mounts mounting the radiator, intercooler, uh, diesel filters and the little fuel cooler, fuel pump and all that kind of stuff 
So we'll go through those in a bit more in detail and get the Land Rover to a point where it's drivable so we can take it out for a test run. So I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. So until then, guys, God bless, peace, and see you next time.